Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. For me to say that my guest today has no filter, well, that, that's a big statement from me, which is why we <laughs> love her so much. After slaying fierce competition 10 years ago on season six of RuPaul's Drag Race, Bianca Del Rio took her tiara and conquered the world. She's now embarking on her sixth comedy tour, Dead Inside. Sorry. She's now embarking on her sixth comedy tour, Dead Inside, with 60, six zero stops across the U.S. and Canada. You can visit thebiancadelrio.com for tickets. She promises to pull no punches. Talking about pop culture, political correctness, current events, cancel culture, and everyday life. Um, let's start before your makeup starts to run. I am so, we have been trying to make this work for a while. No, and I'm so glad it happened because you know, it was uh, literally 10 years ago that I was with you and your mom on In Bed With Joan. And I have not seen you since in person or chatted with you, but I've seen all of the stuff that you've been doing. You've been busy. I've been on the road yelling at people and now we're meeting up again. It's like kismet. It was meant to be. You knew from the moment our eyes locked <laughs> yes, <laughs> that this this particular thing would happen. We both had that that moment, and I thought to myself, God, one day when I have a podcast, yep, I know we'll be together again. Well, you know, it, it's so crazy to me. It's that, first of all, to think that all of that was 10 years ago, which is absolutely yeah. insane how quickly time flies. And I, I'm, you know, I remember old people used to say, time flies, time flies. Well, now I'm that old person going, fuck, where does the time go? So it is wild to think that it was 10 years ago, but then other parts of me, it's like, it was just yesterday. You know, it's that weird thing that plays into your head and mainly because I drink. So the balance is kind of off as it is, but I still can't believe that, that happened so long ago. And you and your mom were so generous and so kind. And I had a blast that day which was so much fun uh and i still to this day get people that come up to me and they go that episode with you melissa and joan is the funniest thing and i'm like how great how great that it lives on you know how fortunate so but you did mention drinking day drink yes. or just or just evening drink or more of a 24 7 cycle girl i'm from new orleans i drink when oh. i'm thirsty i drink <laughs> when i'm thirsty so you start you start with whatever works and then you try to make sense of it. You know, you're like, okay, I'll have a glass of wine. Or you're like, well, ooh, it's a brunch drink. You just drink when you need it. And that's what gets you through life. I mean, look at the choices I've made. I need to fucking drink. Look at this. <laughs> look at this. No right-minded person. No right-minded individual would choose this life, Melissa. So this is this is what it is. You know, I love that you're so committed. So a few yeah. years ago. I should be nice. committed. Oh, God, on so many <laughs> levels. But the nice thing is I always say to people, why would you want to go to heaven when clearly all the people you want to hang out with are going to be in hell? Isn't that the truth? And you know, when you get to hell, I'm going to be the bitch in a red dress with the wristband saying, come this way, come this exactly. way, come this exactly. way. It's not that hot. It's not that hot. Yeah. It, you know what? We'll find some air. There's a breeze. It's like the <laughs> it's, desert. It's a we'll dry it. heat. <laughs> that well, be bullshit. Lots. There'll be lots of shade. I guarantee yeah. it. Lots yeah. of shade. That yeah. dry heat bullshit. Um, <laughs> I live in were, Palm Springs. I know it. <laughs> okay, well, then you are psychotic, whatever. I went Wait, to a wedding. Wait, you can't handle it? You can't no, handle the dry No, I heat? went to a wedding once in uh -huh. Palm Springs, and they had, which supposedly to make it tolerable, yeah. misters. Will oh. you ask a girl before she had a keratin treatment to go stand <laughs> amongst under a the mist. mister. Yeah. I would rather have good hair and sweat. That would be a great book title for you. Melissa amongst the mist. That's genius. That's genius. <laughs> well, it's too much, too little with gorillas in the mist. And I spent oh, wait, plenty you... of, I do you how again, short and swarthy. So much of my money has gone to lasers and waxing. I don't yeah. need to be gorilla. You don't need in to be mist. bothered. I got no. it. I got no. it. I got it. In all seriousness, though, New York Magazine called you the most powerful drag queen in the world, and the New York Times likened you to my mother. Um, yeah. First, just you know what? Back off and get your own act. Let's just start with that. <laughs> well, you know what? J nastiness, hatefulness, and truth is not something that's, that's you know, stolen from anyone. That's just the facts. And I think that's why I appreciated your mother. I mean, there's enough drag queens I know that dress up as your mother, which is insane. But I took it as a huge compliment is that they would even mention me and her in the same sentence, you know? Um, so that I thoroughly enjoyed. But I do see... I do appreciate the fact that, you know, there is a place for it. You know, there is a place for that type of humor. Uh, Cause I think that is missing a lot from our PC world that we live in now. And I don't know if 
people are more PC now than ever, or if it's just the fact that we have social media, you know, and everybody is giving their opinions and telling you that you're wrong and you can't say that and you can't do this. And I often say, you know, I can say what I want. You don't have to like it, but I can say what I want, you know, and that's what it should be. There's a great story about Snoop Dogg. Yeah. Who was hired to perform at someone's bar mitzvah or at some charity. And apparently the audience was horrified. And his reply was, you hire Snoop Dogg, you get Snoop Dogg. Exactly. Exactly. As it should be. And I think that, you know, if, if you went to see Snoop Dogg, let's say you're a Snoop Dogg fan and you didn't get it, you'd be a little upset by it. You know, they all would go, mm, wasn't that funny? Mm, a little too serious. Mm, you, know, you don't want that. You know, deliver yeah. the goods, deliver the goods and own up to it. You know, do what you do and do what you know, you know, and be yourself as I sit here in a wig. Be yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, you know, you've become such a pop culture icon and with the New York Times and New York Magazine, again, all kidding aside, what comes with that level of power? It's got to be some crazy amount of pressure knowing that you and a few other people like Rue and all that really are the faces of an entire community. Well, I mean, I never really thought about it till you just banged it out at this moment. Um, I would say that, you know, the advantage that I have, uh, I would say, is that I've done what I'm doing now on different levels. You know, obviously, I've been in a room performing for people that were just five of them on a Monday night in New York City, or I've been lucky enough to get to do Carnegie Hall, which it's packed. So I think those smaller gigs give you the appreciation for the larger gigs. And with exposure, there's good and bad, you know? And I think that you have to weed out the fuckery and you have to think, all right, I'm not saving the world. I'm just doing what I do and I'm owning up to what I do. Um, and that's kind of been my trajectory, I would say, is just to keep doing what I do. Somebody likes it and also somebody may not like it, but it doesn't change the format of what I'm doing. So I don't necessarily feel the pressure. I think I'm my own worst critic, you know, and, and as far as success is concerned, I say you're only successful if you're working on whatever level, you know, and I say yes to everything. So even if it's a horrible scenario, it becomes a great part of the show, you know? So you've got to say yes to it. It's just what it is. And um, I think that's just where I go. As long as I have things going on and I know that I have a set schedule, I'm happy, you know? Oh, you sound so much like my mother. Um, well, you know, I mean, you know, it, but it's, it's, it's work ethic. You know this as a producer and creating content and putting stuff out there. It's really a work ethic. And either you have it or you don't. I'm not saying that, I'm the funniest or the or, or the most liked in this scenario or or any of that, because that's where people get lost. You know, people think, oh, I need to be this and I need to be like, no, do what you do and enjoy it and live, live in what you've got. You know, the hustle is real. Oh, that it is. So Drag Race, just to re rewind a little bit, was an yeah. enormous springboard for you. Mm -hmm. And you've come back in the past to help the contestants and yeah. to judge and <laughs> lip sync. Yeah. Yeah. But you've also said you won't compete on the show again. No. No, would you go back to high school? No. I oh, I'd rather out. I'd rather die. Right. It's like it was a wonderful as you said. It's an amazing springboard, an amazing platform. I came out unscathed uh 10 years ago that it's like, you know, you don't rob the same bank twice, you know? You don't shit where you eat. And I thought this was great. Um, now it would be a different thing in a different moment. And I was also, at that time, I was uh, 38. So now I'm like, oh no, I was barely fun then at 38. <laughs> I can't imagine going back at 48, you know? Oh God. And there's um, enough th there's enough other contestants that can go back. So it's not, it's not dogging the show, it's going the process. The game has changed uh, and, and the, the process and pressure is a little different than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, I, it just how the sort of, and I'm going to use the word, which makes me want to throw up, um, just so you know, because I'm uh -huh. not this kind of person. The art form. Oof! I, I know. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. Ha has yeah. certainly become um, a much larger platform. And totally. with recognition. But that also brings me to my next question. Are we still allowed to say drag queen? Because I know uh -uh. We get, I get the shit smacked out of me every time I say it. Well, no, I think you can. I am a drag queen. I am a drag queen who does comedy. So it works for me. I think that we now have an umbrella and I'm with you. I'm still trying to learn all the terms 
and tiptoe around how do I say, not say, or what have you. I just call everybody by their name because it's a hell of a lot easier. But for me in particular, drag queen is what I am. There's no identity issues. There's no discovery that I'm having. This is just what it is. Um, and I think that to each, everybody does drag for different reasons. And I am sure if you've ever spoken to any gay person or anyone no, who does really? drag, let I've me never. tell you. They would gladly tell you all about their fucking journey and their life and what they want to be called. But for me, it's drag queen. I have people that say, you know, should I call you Bianca or should I call you Roy? I said, whatever name is on the check, I don't give two shits. Just <laughs> hello is fine. You know, <laughs> it's just what it is. What was your journey? What what was ah, what oh. was childhood life? <laughs> Well, let's start with disappointment. I I was <laughs> I was disappointed with the cards I was dealt, and I think they were too. But I'm the fourth out of five. I'm the oldest boy. Imagine that. Um, and my mother was from Cuba, and my dad was from Honduras. So I think their idea of the American life and what the kids are supposed to be uh, was a little different. And I was different, I guess. And so I was I was called a faggot ever before. I sucked a dick. I was always called a faggot. So in that game, you know, I just went my own merry way. Didn't think drag was the answer. I didn't, it didn't even occur to me or, or comedy or any of that madness. It was just the natural progression of where I went, you know? And then it kind of came my job. And by no means is it my identity. It's just my job. So that was kind of my journey. What was start breaking into stand-up like? Because that is brutal. Of course it is. But you know, it was it was in a gay club. I was there was a drag show that I was a part of. And back in the day, they would be a host of the show and they would have a singing drag queen, they'd have a dancing drag queen, a lip sync drag queen, and always some other second rate drag queen who was friends with the manager. So that's the, that's the cast list. And <laughs> I was there. I or was fucking the manager, one or the oh, other. Oh, that. Yes, yeah, that always works too. Um, actually it was the manager who was fucking us by not paying us. Anyway, long story. Well, that's a but whole separate story. That's a whole other, waiting late to get your money. Never yeah. fun. But um, there was a, a host that was out one night and they asked me to fill in. And basically you were there to talk to a drunk audience on a Wednesday night at midnight in New Orleans, Louisiana. And you're covering a drag queen's costume change. So you've got about five minutes to schmooze with the audience. And I ended up enjoying it because drunk people are your best friend when you're in a club. You can look at it as daunting and go, oh my God, they're gonna attack my act. I had no act at the time. So my, my crowd work, so to speak, or my interaction with the people is kind of what I thoroughly enjoyed. And that's what they started to come for. So it just progressed into doing it. So it wasn't a conscious choice, conscious choice. A <laughs> uh, conscious choice of, I'm having a stroke. These teeth are new. But I was <laughs> I was thinking, you know, this was just the easy way for me to perform. And it just so happened I was in drag. You know, something I didn't know, which was that you grew up in New Orleans. Do you think in growing up in such a, um, and again, another word I hate, progressive <laughs> culture um, in New Orleans, which is very, you know, come one, come all. Yeah. Made you making your life decisions a little bit easier because you knew there was a built-in community to support you? Oh, totally. And and also it's just, it's the place, it's such an amazing place, obviously for food and for culture. And, and if you like to drink, you know, it's the poor man's Vegas, uh, but it's realer than Vegas. Um, I think it, it was just a wonderful place to be the gay community. This is back in the day, as I said, you know, before cell phones and before social media, where you talk to your friends and said, I'm going to meet you out at 10 p.m. And if you weren't there, they thought you were dead. You know, this was a different world. Right. So um, they were, I'm grateful that I was there in my younger years and they gave me a better sense of self. You know, they were all drunk saying you could do anything. So it was very helpful in later years. Uh, and I go back quite often, you know, but I have to be careful because, you know, some people owe me money and I owe them money. So you got to just skirt into town and skirt the fuck out. But yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good times. And I'm grateful because it's also very accepting. If you can live in New Orleans, I often say if you can live in New York, you can kind of live anywhere. I, I, yeah. I mean, could you imagine if you've been born in sort of a flyover? Oh, girl, can't. I can't be bothered. And to hear those people, what's, I don't know what's worse. The people that are from Idaho or their fucking story about living in Idaho. It's just too much. It's just too much. Did you ever have a moment where you thought, and every performer does, this is just too hard? 
Yeah, every day when I'm shaving. I mean, I gotta <laughs> shave balls, I gotta shave my face. And speaking of hard, my face alone is hard. <laughs> but yes, it's a lot. Drag drag is, is quite a bit. There's no easy way to do it. If there is, please give me your cliff notes. Please tell me how to do it. But it, it is a complicated vessel, but yet in the end, it's also like, this is my armor. You know, this is what I do. This is, if I, if I did it without drag, it would feel weird. I've done it when they've lost my luggage, but you still just kind of plow through it. So it, for me, um, I've kind of gotten over it because it's the business side of it. You go, all right, time to put on the monkey suit. Here we go. It's interesting. You brought up when they lost your luggage. How did your, how did your, uh, <laughs> how did, how did your, your material land? Not in drag. Oh, honey. Because that honey. had to be, a, that's a tough pivot. Well, you know, I often say, what is a drag queen without their luggage? A man. I was a fucking <laughs> man. And that's what it was. So I had to, I was in, I think I was in Wisconsin of some place. And I was performing at a remodeled pizza hut, which was a gay club. Because I say yes to everything, Melissa. I'm not a picky I, bitch. Yeah, it's no. The, it's it's the art form. It's the art form. Art form. It's so, all for the it's all for the art. It's all for the art. So I was performing at a remodeled Pizza Hut in Wisconsin and got there and there was only two flights heading into Wisconsin. I was on the early flight and I got there and I had about 2 hours before I had to get in drag. So they said we don't have your luggage. I said no worries. They go there's a second flight coming in. It'll be at 8 o'clock. I'm like shit, that's cutting it close. They're like but your bags are on that flight. Don't fret. I'm like, no big deal. So I stayed in my hotel room and then I got the call from the airline saying it's not on that flight. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Now you have the options of do I cancel the gig or do I go and do the gig out of drag? And I said, listen, I have got 10 people waiting for me at a remodeled pizza hut. I'm going to do this show. So it was drag race moment where I said it's a drag race mini challenge. I went to a Walmart, bought everything I could possibly get. I got construction paper to make eyelashes. I got a scarf <laughs> to make a turban. I got a onesie, I had slippers, and I went on stage and did the show. So I did the best I could, but it's what it was. You know, you've got to go on with the show. Absolutely. And and anyone who has had to do that for different reasons in different areas. Totally. Me, I can, you know, I, as I always say, you know a true showbiz kid. And yeah. you can make three meals yeah. off a craft service table. Do it. That's talent. Three complete. That's talent. I can do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> And not have to repeat anything. That's you see, as a drag queen, I never eat when I'm going to the event, but I do scoop it up to leave later. And now when I'm on the road doing my own show, I find myself telling my assistant in the dressing room, I'm like, grab those waters, grab that, grab that. And he's like, oh, well, why are we taking it? I go, just take it. Let's just steal it. He goes, free. Well, the best is he's like, you're the one that bought it. I'm like, oh yeah, it is my show. I forgot. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, it's mine. Let's grab it. To this day, I am so trained that I empty out a dressing room. And that's from my mom and my dad. Empty everything that's it. That's out. That's it. Yep, if it is clear not it. moving. My mom, I saw my mom once take a lamp. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, you know what? It's a good idea. If it's not bolted, take it. Take Absolutely. It. And what are they going to do? What are they going to do? They have a great story now. Joan yeah. Rivers stole my lamp. I heard also a great story about a big country performer from many, many years ago. Yeah. Who literally stole... Walked in and picked up the giant floral arrangement in the yeah. lobby of a hotel and, and just walked onto her bus with it. Where are you going to go with that? Where, what, especially on a bus, there's no space for that. There's, yeah, but, I, but that's God bless. God you just, bless. You never Take what know. you can. Take what you can. Um, <laughs> what do you, you know, think? I'm, I'm thinking now, which, who was the big country star? Who was the big country? You'll tell me after. Yeah. I'll tell you after. Okay. Because again, it's just a story. I'd have to start using the words allegedly. Got it. Oh, and you've and already it, had to, you had it, to use all these other words today too. So it's too much. It's just, again, it's so confusing. <laughs> um, do you think the increased visibility of drag performers has made it easier or harder? Ooh. Um, I think, listen, visibility is great. Uh, the fact that we exist in this world, I mean, you know, as a coming from showbiz, you understand that we've been around forever. Um, and there's been different pockets of people performing and stuff. And there's many before us, Jim Bailey and Charles Pierce, who were all brilliant drag performers in the early 60s and 70s. Um, and of course, it predates all of that as well. But those performers back then, it was a different world that you traveled in. So now that it's kind of everywhere, uh, so to speak, it's also influencing a lot of younger people to want to perform in drag, which I say, the more the merrier, you know, do whatever you want. But it does come with 
its criticisms. It is harder to find the talented ones. <laughs> Not everybody is meant for the stage, as we say. Um, some people are great on a reality show, but it doesn't lend itself to an act or, or show business. So I think it's kind of like that American Idol aspect or the voice aspect where, you know, there are some really talented people, but what's going to happen at some point, I don't know. Like as far as um, oversaturation, that's my big word of the day. Oversaturation seems to exist because there are so many. So for me, I'm grateful I did Drag Race 10 years ago. It was a different time. There wasn't as many franchises as far as the show was concerned. We were just the American version. So we kind of had all eyes on us because it was new and different. And now that they're on their 16th, 17th, season um it's kind of exploded which great it's in people's living rooms downside you're not going to get noticed because there's so many fucking queens in the world oh, so I, um uh, i think you're you're pretty easy to notice um, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and i go for just, subtle yes we and mm -hmm. and as you should as i should yeah no photos no photos no photos none <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of mainstream actually Back in May, you signed with Creative Artists Agency, yes. the big, the big dog, CAA. Um, obviously, this means that drag has moved beyond bars and nightclub. And oh, is, totally right. I was gonna say, and the agents are now and the are really buying in now. Do you think? And I have to say this so carefully. Shout out to Steve Levine, <laughs> Steve who Levine, is, who's your booking agent, who was my yeah. mother's booking agent. Do you think the agents are just out to make a quick buck? Well, I think if the agent didn't, you're screwed. You want yeah. somebody that's going to work, you know? Yeah. And for me, for many years, it was me and my, I say assistant, but my friend that I paid too much money to, that would kind of negotiate all of my deals and all of the things that were going on. And then you get to a point where you're like, all right, I'd be nice to have somebody fight for me. And I got to say with Steve Levine, he was lovely and great in the beginning. And he said to me, you know, first, I'm going to do some... the, In the beginning. Well, I meant he was very honest, I should say, in the beginning. <laughs> by simply saying, I'm going to feel around within the company and find out who knows you, what knows you, and see if we're a good fit. And I thought, you know, that's that's what you want. You want somebody that's going to look out for you and also somebody who knows your best interests. And having the client roster he had before, it seemed like a good fit, but he wanted to make sure. And so with it, they sit down with you and they talk to you. And I'm like, look, I want to work. I want to work. I'll do it. I'll be a dead hooker on CSI. I will oh, do a puppet show. I'll I've sign wanted, me up. I've always wanted to be a body on Law & Order. There you but go. And you haven't done thing. it? What? Well, here, I can't be in the body bag because if they zip it up, I would have a problem. And mm -hmm. you can't slide me into the, the coroner's drawer. But okay. I'm more than happy to be covered by a sheet. Got it. Okay, so you just like to be laid out as dead on side of the road. Okay, got it. What about like something like Unsolved Mysteries? Would you do that? Or is that too, too lowbrow? Um, I think if I'm going to do it, I think I have to shoot high. You have to shoot high? I hear you. I hear you. You, know, you want to network you, primetime television. I get it. You, if you shoot for the middle, you're going to end on the low. So I think I need I to agree. shoot high and okay. be willing to pay my dues As on like should. forensic files. As you should. When I see forensic files is my show. I, I thoroughly, I watch it every, no matter where I am in the country, you can always find it on any television. And I sit back and watch it. And it's just amazing. I find myself looking at people going, that's how you kill them. Luminol, Luminol, you know, you're going to get figured out. Like who changes the carpet two days after someone goes missing? You know immediately what's going to happen. People okay. don't know how to kill. They don't I know was, how to kill properly. Yeah. I, I was about to say you're about to go on your 60 city <laughs> tour. Um, I, I was going to ask, do you do any weird things? Because my mother, A, oh, used God. to have to sleep, on with the, sleep with some of the lights on in her room. Okay. And she put on forensic files. Because oh, like no! she said, yes, like no matter where you are, where no matter where you are, she said it's very soothing. It is because no matter where you are, it's something that feels uh, uh, that you know that yes. feels familiar. Yeah, and it's at, the best at parties between that and Law and Order. When my mother and I would be at a party and like nobody was talking this or we didn't know what to talk about, we used to talk about committing the crimes. There you are. You see, you watch three episodes, you become an expert. It's the best thing in the world. And I watch it like anytime I'm in a room, that's the one thing that I I, I find that I have to have. And it's the just TV. there. It's just there. Yeah, it's it's the one connection to anything in the real world. But it is fascinating that they changed. They did a reboot, as yes. they say, of the show. And the narrator is not the same. 
has does not have the same effect. No, I have to watch the files, old episodes. Yeah, the original forensic, forensic. Files too. But then I had a friend who says, if you like forensic files, and at this point I have seen every fucking episode, they're like, you should watch Unsolved Mysteries. Well, you know the problem with that, Melissa? It's you unsolved. You get to the end of it. Exactly. It's you're trying unsolved. to watch. You're like, oh, yeah. I was on this fucking journey and nothing gets solved. So yeah, problematic. Yeah. But the OG forensic files, that's the one. That's I, the one. You and I. That's it. We're like that's this it. on that. That's it. Um, you know, like my mom, you you don't care or you do care what you say and how you say it because you're not really out to offend anybody. But in, no. this, in this environment, yeah, how do you, where do you find the line? Do you work out in small clubs trying out new material? Are you do, do you know sometimes like my mother was know where the line is and she'd put a toe over yeah. in a club, yeah, and, and try and read it there. And you're about to go on this huge tour. What's your process of, of getting enough material? That's always oh God the well, biggest that's, problem. Well, that's the main thing is that you have to go out there with more than what you need. And that's the ticket. You have to go in with more than what you need. And then once you're out there, it's funny. You will always remember. I, always, I don't always remember what made them laugh, but I remember what they didn't like. So if it's something that just hits and you're like, mm, I'll try it once twice perhaps uh, a third time never really works you kind of feel the instincts and you feel the people out but to go out on the road you just have to have more than what you need and the show in your head is like four hours long you know and then you're basically putting out fires is what you're doing you know and you're sampling this and you're sampling there and it's always fascinating from when the show starts uh the first day of the tour and when it ends what you end up with what is the edited version because you have to self-edit there's no way to fix it you're with those people you're live uh and whether you're in america or you're in a different country the show changes so i leave lots of space for those moments to interact with those people and also so much shit goes wrong as you know you know whether it's a light cue or there's no table or there's no this or you know what i mean there, there's there's a fire or there's somebody that has a heart attack all that shit happens during the show You've got to roll with the punches. You know, you still have to deliver. So you just have to start out with more than what you need. And usually I say, if I'm thinking it, someone else is thinking it, you know, right. it's just it, as I sit here in a wig, I'm going to say there's so much comedy in truth uh, that you can bring out. But also self-deprecation is, is a huge important factor, you know, because people are on your side. If you can make fun of yourself, girl, there's nothing anyone can say to me that I'm going to go, oh. That bothers me. Fuck off. <laughs> where have you, have you had that moment where, because I can only remember my mother having it once, mm. where you say, I've gone too far. Oh, I think, I think there's been a couple of times in my, in my life where I feel like, or someone has said it's gone too far and it made me rethink something. Uh, which is always awkward because I usually think in the moment that I'm doing what I think is right. And that's the thing. Context is very important. I was having this context conversation with someone before where nowadays with social media, there's like a punchline or there's a moment taken, but there's no context. What's the setup? Where do we start from? Who is this person or what was, what was I talking about to lead into this? Um, but I've, I have rethought things, but I have a new philosophy that I'm going to throw on you, okay, which I think hear. is the way to go about it is that, all right, let's say as a comedian mm -hmm. and you say something and someone doesn't like it and they go, you're canceled. You're done. That's not funny. That's this. I go, you know what? Let's take someone like Celine Dion, for example. Wonderful songstress, lovely pop star. She performs and sings some of the best songs we love, but she's also put out some albums with some shit songs we didn't like, right? That we're like, oh, we didn't like track three, didn't like track four, but do we take that away and go, oh, she's not a singer anymore? It's just that not everything is going to appeal to everybody, you know? And in the moment you think it works, but it may not work in the long run. So own it, never apologize, but just own it. That's how I look at it. Yeah, we come from very similar philosophies. Do you yeah. feel like you can get away with a little bit more because it's a character that's saying and doing these things that are things that Roy would never say or do? Well, you can see, I would love to be that person to say, hmm, yes, it's a character. No, I'm still a hateful bitch. I'm still <laughs> a hateful bitch, but... It's the packaging, I think, for them. You know, it's the theatricality for them. I think when you're on, you're on. You know, when you go to a party and you're expected and people are in your face and you're having a moment. But also, I could be a human being, but I think the thought process is the same. So I wouldn't look at it as, hmm. Um, but to an audience, I think they think we can laugh at it because this is not real. You know, that right. it's kind of like the, the drag helps you get away with murder. 
literally and figuratively. Um, Very much especially so. Especially on, on forensic files. You know like, how to do it. <laughs> you would know how to do it, exactly. You know how to do it. Was there ever a plan B for little <laughs> Roy Haylock? <laughs> what was plan B? Uh, no, there actually <laughs> is. There was no plan B. And you know, I think what's crazy is that it, it, this world, I didn't think I'd even be doing drag this long. You know, it's just kind of snowballed and you just roll with what's in front of you. But I know that there is an expiration date on the drag aspect of it. Um, I don't want to be but schlepping there... bags. Yes. Yes, I don't want to be schlepping bags and tucking my balls for the rest of my life. It's a lot of work. So well, I, I assume you have a bag schlepper. I do. I don't have a ball tucker. Maybe oh, I was gonna maybe say, that's what I got to work on. Is that in your? Is it? Is it start putting that in your backstage rider. It will um, be now. It will yeah. be now. How many? Everyone always is curious. How many costumes do you bring on the road? Oh, it varies. Uh, so we're starting with this 60 dates is the first US and Canada leg. So I would say they'd probably be about six stage costumes. And then I do a meet and greet every night. So I do a meet and greet where you hug and schmooze with 150 to 200 people a night. So there's different looks for that as well, which would probably be about six to 10. You know, so the stage stuff is the easier stuff. And then the stuff that are where for the meet and greet, you got to be careful. You can't wear long hair because you've got people hugging you. You can't have sequins with all the shit sticking to it. Uh, so you try to make it as comfortable as you could be because that's about two hours pre-show that you do all the photos and, and schmooze with everybody, which is great for the show in the end because you get to schmooze with them and you find out who's in a miserable relationship. You find out who the drunk is. You find out who's in a wheelchair and it all works out great for the show after that. I was going to say, but people don't understand how how much time and effort goes into being so glamorous. There you go. There you go. It, it is taxing. But, you and know, thought. I do it for the people. I yeah. do it for the people. Like when your <laughs> hair gets stuck in someone's sweater. It's just always it's the a worst. Thing. What, That's walk what me through. Up. Yeah. Walk me through the process because everybody's always curious. Like you. How long does it take you? After well, you shave, after you shave. Okay, so we've shaved everything at this point. I can get ready in an hour, Melissa. It, wow. I can't, but you know, there's no blending here. You just add a lash, that's the ticket. <laughs> just add a lash, because you're gonna be in HD. You just add a layer. Um, I can do it in about an hour, you know, but I like I like a little longer if I'm doing a photo shoot or I'm set up. Like when you're on the road, I like to get into the venue early. I don't know how you feel. I like to get there, feel it out, set the room, have the air condition on, lay out all my shit and then getting dragged. So I could do it in an hour, but two hours is great. And that's from head to toe, like in heels, in hair, all of that, and then out to meet the people. You gotta make oh, it quick. That yeah. is very important. Um, is there a Mr. Del Rio? I am dating someone. <gasps> I, I am dating someone. Yeah, I'm not married though. I'm not that gay. But yes, we're, 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 I'm dating and you know, the good thing is that he doesn't like anything to do with this. So it's lovely. You know, he doesn't think I'm special on any level, which is the key if, to a relationship. If your relationship, takes on a long-term situation. Are you gonna hyphenate names? Oh, or no. You... That's too gay, Melissa. I'm not that gay, damn it. <laughs> well, I was just thinking of monogram <laughs> stationery. If I wanna send you a fucking gift, <laughs> I need to know how many initials have to go on the top. Well, Jesus. send me the send me the lamp your mother stole. <laughs> that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I put out some feelers to my okay. listeners and to ask you questions. Okay. And, you know, things they really want to know that may not be covered in interviews. So okay. bear with me here. Um, my first question is from listener Larry A. from Palm Springs, California. Oh, mm -hmm. um, How would you describe your style? Flashy, trashy, or I've got to stop day drinking? <laughs> I think I've got to stop day drinking. And also I, I say for, for the elderly people of the audience it is that it, it's a cross between Joan Crawford and Bozo the Clown. You know, that's what you're getting there. So you're getting a very painted clown-like appearance, almost death-like. You know, if I close my eyes right now, you're going to say, she looks peaceful. Watch. See? CSI. I think so, yeah. I'd be perfect. You looked, yeah. You looked completely peaceful. peaceful. I like that. There I you like go. that. So I would say, yeah, I would say that it's, I got to stop day drinking, but yeah, that's, that's it. That would be the best look. That would, that's the approach. There's nothing glamorous here. Just remember, nobody likes a quitter. Um, no, uh, ain't that the truth? <laughs> okay. The next question is from Larry A. from Galveston, Texas. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Do you have a bucket list? What and who is on it? Oh, you know, I don't have a bucket list and I'm often, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of people with lists. You know, I often think that if, if, 
I'm not about like writing down goals and saying, this is what I want to do. I'm just happy to be out and about, you know, I'm happy to, to get through the next day. So I'm not an overachiever on that level. So bucket lists don't work for me. But as far as being in the room or having someone there that I could ridicule. And, or someone and, you could kill. Someone you someone maybe I want. Could, well, there's a couple people. Um, but I would say the front runner currently is Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know, oh. that's, she's, she's, yeah, she's on the top of my list. Yeah. I, yeah. you are, I agree. So, oh, we have another Larry A. This one's from Oh, wow. Akron, what Ohio. a coincidence. What a coincidence. I know. Uh, he <laughs> asks, the other night when we had dinner, why didn't you offer to pick up the check? I got it last time. <laughs> <laughs> he's also my parole officer. I don't know if you know this. No, so I did keeping, not know that. Larry A. is keeping a close eye on me. Yes, that is, you know, the thing was, he offered to pay for the dinner, so I let him roll with it. You know, he's the one that got the senior citizen discount, so I wasn't going to complain. But you get yeah. what you get at Denny's. Um, he also had a follow-up. Um, oh. Also, did you think I wasn't going to notice that you took my credit card when I got up to use the bathroom? <laughs> if things were so tough, you just could have told me. I could have. I could have. It's We call it the Palm Springs surprise. It is what it is. If I have to have dinner at 3 p.m., I also want to go shopping. So I did what I had to do. Never a trust a drag queen. Yeah. Uh, this one's from Larry A. Currently in the Supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. That's my people. Uh, yeah. If you could hook up with one celebrity, who would it be? And don't say Al Roker because he's mine. Oof. Okay. A celebrity. Who would be a good celebrity? Oh God, there's, well. Who's your we celebrity have to, crush? We have to define celebrity now because everybody's a fucking celebrity in their minds. But I would say, who would be? Legitimate oh. celebrity. Okay, legitimate celebrity. Who would I find attractive? Oh God, there's really, I just can't. Who's the front runner? Who do I always talk about? I'm trying to think. There's got to be somebody that I fantasize about. I could tell you who. Oh, I can give you a list of people that it's not. It's not okay. Ben Affleck. It's not Ben Affleck. Okay. I'm not into that. Um, uh, I could go the gay route and go Cheyenne Jackson, but he's he's gay, so it's not really a conquest. You know, you're kind of like, mm, he'd probably do it for $20 anyway. <laughs> I would say he would, mm, who would be the one that I would want that would be the most exciting celebrity. This is sick, challenging. Brad I can't Pitt, even think. George Clooney. Mm, nah, 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 too white, too boring. No, not for them. And also don't want to deal with Angelina. I would say, I would say, who would be? David Schwimmer, when he was younger. When he was younger, he was cute from Friends. Yes, okay, now he could look like, that. that's, that's that, yeah, kind of nerdy looking type. But for a white man, I'm not bad at it. I'm not okay, bad at it. There you mm -hmm. go. There you um, go. Uh, Larry A just texted me. Oh, okay. Which Larry uh, A? Larry A from Akron. A oh, Akron. Akron. Akron, uh, Akron Ohio. Uh, Larry yeah. A from Akron. Uh-huh. And I know it was you who stole my favorite <laughs> Mololo Blonics, you bitch. You really think your giant hooves are the same size as my p perfectly delicate little ballerina feet? I want them back. Listen, if it means anything, I'm just going to let Larry A know that I'm not wearing them as shoes. I'm wearing them as earrings because I need something to distract from my fucking face. Larry A is my stalker, as you can see. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Yes. Any resolutions for 2024? Oh, God. You know, this is the pressure of it. I, I just had a conversation with someone going, you know, we're well into January. I think I just get so sick of the people that are saying, you know, Happy New Year. Enjoy New Year. It's like we're we're midway now. I never really make resolutions, but I'm going to say because it's an election year, I'm going to try to be a better person. That's not going to happen. Wow, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And I'm, um, am I supposed to be a good host and go like, oh, that's so oh, heartfelt yeah. when I want to well, say you, you're so full of shit. I am full of shit. I'm going to say the usual to lose weight, go to the gym, drink less. But we know that's not going to happen. No. It's an election year, bitch. We're going to be drinking down in February. No, I don't know. I, you know what? I'm, my, my resolution is to not change anything. It's just to make it through this year alive was the biggest accomplishment that I can do. That's it. That's the only thing I can strive for. I can only hope that I make it far. The Dead Inside Tour is on now. Visit thebiancadelrio.com for tickets. This has been such a joy. Well, please, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. I haven't seen you in 10 years. So this means we have to do it again in the next 10 years? You is know that what I, we're planning to do? Well, hopefully we'll both still look this good. Uh, oh, yes. I'm, I'm trying yes. to decide what to do. 
under here. I think I'm I think I'm looking in the camera. I think yeah. I'm ready for this. Well, you know what you could do? Just wear a turtleneck. Wear a turtleneck till you decide. There yeah, you go. Yeah, but I have a short neck. Oh, but you could do a little mock neck. They exist. Yeah, Add a you scarf. Know, you know, you, you know, gotta dress it, it up. It doesn't I have trouble with turtlenecks. Well, you know, I'm interested in snatching this. See, I just want to do Oh that. yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, Maybe there we, we go. Get a twofer? Let's go together. And if we die, we can then be on CSI. That would be brilliant. Or they can and make a story out of our show. Exactly. And yeah, that would that I, I like where we're going with this. I think yeah. we could do it. Let's go do joint surgery and this whole other this is what we want. Just that little bit up behind the ear. I'll get us some earrings and yeah, no one will know the eyes are. Clean up the jawline. We can work on that. We could do it. We could do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you got me looking at it, bitch. Now this is not going to be fun. <laughs> I have I have more interviews today, and I'm going to be like this the whole time, going, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, I see it. Little take. I see Beyond it. I see it. I see it. For real. Thank you so much. Thank you, my love. Great talking with you. Mwah, mwah, mwah.